So thank you all for joining us. Like I was saying, this is um, their second of many exciting upcoming events um, hosted by the Communication Design MFA program at Texas State. I'm Molly Sherman, and I'd like to introduce Alice Lee. Um, we're both assistant professors of communication design here at Texas State, and we're graduate co-advisors of the MFA program. I'd like to thank Nakia Edmond, um, who helps with many administrative tasks for the program, and Michael Niblett, who's the director of the School of Art and Design, and the faculty, staff, and students um, in our school for their support. We ask that you mute your audio to limit interruptions and distractions during the lecture. You're welcome to, but um, not expected to uh, turn off your video once the lecture begins. Um, and we, but we do ask that you turn it back on if you feel comfortable during the Q&A. We're recording the event and we will be sharing the recording on the Texas State um, Communication Design YouTube channel. And so I'd like to introduce to all of you Thick Press. Um, Thick Press makes unusual, unusual books about care, work, and the work of care. They are Julie Cho, a graphic designer, and Erin Siegel, a social worker. Julie has an MFA in graphic design from Yale School of Art. She is part of a three-woman graphic design studio called Omnivore. She also teaches graphic design at Otis College of Art and Design and cares for her daughters, Yuna and Cleo. Julie lives in LA and her children with her children and her husband, David. Erin is a social worker with an independent social work and an independent social work academic. After completing a PhD in social work in 2015 and serving as an adjunct professor at Catholic University and Smith College, Erin turned her attention towards caregiving, creative work, and direct practice with low-income senior citizens. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her children, Nora and Teddy, and her husband, Michael. And it's with great pleasure and honor tonight to invite Erin and Julie here to share some of their work with us. I'm going to um, put the spotlight on them and so they can take it away. There we go. Can we all see my screen and hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool, cool. Hi everybody. So good to see all of you here. Um, so we're, we're so happy to be here this with you this evening um, and to talk about our publishing practice, uh, which as Molly mentioned, we organize around care. Uh, thanks so much to Molly and Alice for organizing this lecture and to their students for being here tonight um, and for all of your interest in experimental books and publishing. We got to see a, a few of your faces. Uh, we miss seeing you in person, but we're excited to hear from you um, at the Q&A at the end. So we wanted this present uh, presentation to be as accessible as possible. Uh, we're actually working on a project right now uh, about accessibility statements before events. Um, although we'll be sharing lots of images, we'll try to talk in a way that makes sense to those who, for whatever reason, are only engaging with the audio. Uh, the presentation, as you guys heard, will be recorded. And if you want a copy of the recording, um, which will have closed captioning, uh, please email us afterwards um, and we'll share, you know, all that information with you. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about care recently. Um, in feminist writing, in, in my field, social work, um, in the publishing world, it's become kind of a catchphrase. Uh, we love to use presentations like this as an opportunity, not just to share our work, but also to work through concepts that we've been thinking and talking about. So we hope you'll bear with us. Um, part of our intention tonight is to flesh out our understanding of care by um, talking to you about how care permeates all aspects of our work in content, in form, and in process. So thanks for being with us while, while we do that. Um, but let's start with introductions. So as Molly had mentioned um, uh, quickly, I'm, I'm Julie Cho, um, I'm a graphic designer. I'm originally from New Jersey and I identify as second generation Korean American. 
I've been practicing design for about 15 years with a studio called Omnivore. Um, and there are three of us. I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, Karen, my one partner is in Portland and Alice, my other partner is in Brooklyn. Um, we started in 2002 and I joined in 2007. And between the three of us, we teach, we practice design, uh, we collaborate on projects outside of studio like Thick Press. Um, and we're working mothers. Um, in 2010, I think between the three of us, we all had a kid like three months apart from each other. Um, and as Molly said, I have two daughters, uh, Yuna and Cleo, ages eight and 10. So our studio was born out of a desire to work intimately and collaboratively with our clients. Uh, we work on small scale work like book projects to larger scale, uh, like visual identities and environmental graphic projects. I'm really grateful to Karen and Alice for being both mentors, co-conspirators and friends for so long. We have a lot to say about small studio life, which um, I will touch on a little bit tonight. Um, we often joke that together, three of us equals one human being, um, a three-headed monster of sorts. Um, and I've also been teaching for the past 10 years at Otis College of Art and Design in the undergraduate commerce and graduate graphic design departments. And I also have a long-term collaborative partnership with a really good friend, Katie Hamburger, called The Slow Season, where we do self-initiated and commission projects. And I'm Erin Siegel, a social worker, and now on the side, a publisher. I occasionally publish about social work, and I've been practicing social work for almost 20 years. Uh, like Molly said, I got my MSW um, from Columbia in 2003, um, and then I got a PhD in 2015. I used to work in early childhood intervention. These days, I kind of went to the opposite spectrum um, of the developmental cycle and I work with senior citizens. Right now I do uh, virtual group work and casework at a senior wellness center in Washington, DC, uh, where I live with my husband and my two kids. Um, and so the two of us met in high school many years ago, about 30 years ago, and have stayed ever since um, through school, graduate school, marriage and kids. And now let's move into our work um, to give you a sense of our origin story and our priorities, our process. Uh, we're gonna talk about our three major titles and a brief visual essay that we created, which Molly's students I hope have read. Um, that's for an artist publisher called Temporary Services. Uh, we'll also talk about our book emerging series and our printout series. So our plan is to talk about the work chronologically sort of highlighting how each project has advanced our understanding of what it means to organize our practice around care and really just care um, in general. Okay, so now on to the origin story and our first book. Uh, it all started in late spring of 2017. At that time, the two of us were planning a long weekend getaway to the California desert, I think near Palm Springs. Um, for a few weeks, we'd been talking, we'd been emailing about the possibility of working on a project together. And it was Julie who initiated this conversation. She, I think, wanted to do something new and meaningful, but also in response to her life as a designer and an educator and a mom. Uh, so we had both been, been in practice, as you know, for many years, trying to balance work with life and caring for our, for our young kids. Um, and around that time, I posted this photo of pages from Amy Krauss Rosenthal's Uni, the Unicorn, which is one of our family's favorite books, because of course, it's about unicorns. Um, but also because my youngest daughter's name is Uni, her Korean name is Uni, and my oldest is Yuna. Um, so growing up, I rarely saw myself reflected in the books I read. Um, and how amazing was it to find uh, a book that almost sounded like my kids' names. Uh, so what my husband did is he colored the main character's hair from blonde to black on every page so our girls could see themselves in the main character. So this feeling of seeing, of reflecting back, witnessing started to circle our orbits and was something that Aaron had picked up on. So Aaron started thinking about 
um, these memoirs that she had gathered with her work with seniors as the culmination of a storytelling group that she facilitated at, at the senior center. What would it mean to think about how those stories could live on? Who could they be for? How could their stories be a kind of gift to their grandkids where they could see themselves in those stories? So I started playing around with the stories. Um, they were in Spanish, but I was sort of translating them into English um, and playing with them. And I asked the seniors how they felt about making a book out of pieces of their memoirs. And they said they liked the idea. So Aaron brought the emerging manuscript to our trip uh, to the desert and where we talked and talked and talked about our disillusionment with aspects of both of our fields, the social work and design. And it really reminds me of, um, in her book, Social Practices, the art critic and novelist, Chris Krauss, um, she says that most blogs and imprints and zines, including her own, um, begin from, quote, a social situation out of love, but also out of vengeance against the status quo and what was and was not considered important. And that's exactly what it was like for us. There was the social situation, there was the love, um, but there was also this vengeance, which over the course of those days in the desert, um, we talked about a lot about how our current world undervalues care and process and how we just wished it could be different. And that was when Julie told me the, about the world of small experimental presses, which some of you have been learning about um, and utopian publishing practices. And then somehow we decided that we would start, should start our own press um, and the book based on the seniors memoirs should be our first title. So we said we were gonna be chronological, but we'll return to that project um, in a minute. But first we're gonna skip ahead um, to this other project, because I think it really encapsulates what we talked about in the desert and what it really was that we felt um, vengeance towards and what we thought was missing in social work and in design. So this artistic publishing practice called Temporary Services, who knew about us, our brand new press um, through social media, they invited us to contribute an image and a text and the prompt was, what problems can artist publishers solve? I think, Erin, when you wrote the answer to this question, you were reflecting on how the question itself was problematic, uh, symptomatic of a much larger condition that I think we've been grappling with, which is what does practicing care work, design, teaching look like under the framework, framework of our current world under neoliberalism? Um, which is such a huge topic to define because there are various schools of thoughts associated with it. But our focus is really grounded on the idea of free market capitalism, globalization, and consequently austerity measures and privatization and what that means for our respective practices. And for us, um, it's really about how market logic, the logic of the market gets applied to everything. Um, including this very specific idea of the human person. Um, it's the idea that we're rational, we're consumers and producers, we're separate from one another, we're separate from nature. Um, just to give you sort of more concrete examples from my social work practice, um, I continuously run into the idea that people should be diagnosed and then treated and it should all happen in a short-term and cost-effective way where care workers are monitored to uh, ensure that they're engaging in what we call best practices. So care work becomes about fixing problems, not about moving resources to people who need them, not about accompanying people in their journey. And for care workers um, who go into the field because they're wonderful people who wanna provide care, um, they find themselves drowning in paperwork. Um, they can't get resources for their clients because there aren't enough supports like affordable housing. Their clients might be struggling with bills, but they're making slightly too much money to qualify for benefits or they need long-term therapy, but they can only get six to eight sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy because of their insurance. So you have these caring people spending time on all this stuff that doesn't feel like care and they feel alienated 
and burnt out. Um, so in design, I see neoliberalism directly relating to how creative work is also valued. Um, so, and how as uh, Arden Stern and Sammy, uh, Sammy Siegelbaum suggest in the intro to the special issue of design and neoliberalism, uh, or design and culture uh, titled Design and Neoliberalism, that because of neoliberalism, concepts like design thinking and strategy, quote unquote, proliferated by universities like MIT and Stanford, who have very dedicated kind of D, D schools, uh, design thinking schools, shifted the value of design. And for me, that's graphic design away from craft and what I believe as a kind of objectness to more invisible immaterial concepts of design and what kind of John Mita uh, describes as like um, designing with post-its and whiteboards and uh, using team members and concepts of time. Um, this isn't to say that objects aren't designed anymore. However, I am interested in how this directly affects the practice of small des design studio life, wherein creative work, at least here in America, and by creative for me, it means uh, form, typography, um, image making. These like forms need to be legitimized by these immaterial concepts, such as strategy and thinking and all these things. Um, and they need to be legitimized to be deemed financially valued. And um, we, my studio and I, and those of us who practice really small scale design, we often find ourselves in this like existential loop of how to think about creative value in any really meaningful way. So those were some of the concerns that um, we addressed in our response to that question, what problems can artist publishers artist publishers solve. Um, and we worked together to create a visual essay, which served as kind of a manifesto, um, an expression of our project. And as Julie said, the response to the question was that the problem solving impulse itself, which comes from a neoliberal place, um, is the problem because it crowds out possibilities for generosity and unplanned outcomes that we can't even imagine because we're so mired in the world as it is, not the world as it could be. Yeah, and, and this project was also quite grounding as it established a creative process, a real back and forth between Aaron as the writer editor and me as the designer. Um, there was a kind of rhythm that was established between how we developed the form, the content, the design of our work. Um, and this rhythm, which was really short, interrupted, back and forth, tangential, discursive, growing on itself, um, connected to how we really experienced life and work and parenting. And particularly the work of the press, which we're always doing in between our, our other things. Um, so for me, it was also a light bulb to connect Erin's reflections as a social worker, practicing in the real world to my work as a designer working on a, uh, working in a small studio, balancing teaching and home life. Um, I always think about how life is full of interruptions as a parent, but the creative practice is also full of interruptions. And now back after that interruption to that first major title, um, Recuerdos de Nuestro Pasado, which is a four voice memoir about growing up in El Salvador, immigrating to the US and growing old in Washington DC uh, along with other senior citizens at the center. Um, it's also about group process and community. As mentioned earlier, it emerged from a storytelling group that Aaron facilitated at a senior wellness center um, in DC. The group culminated in Aaron recording each senior telling their story in 30 minutes. And that recording kind of served as um, a warm up for the process. So after I recorded the stories, I transcribed the sessions and then I gave each senior a copy of their story in Spanish bound in a report cover. And these stories were so good. I, I wanted to do something with them. Um, and that's where Julie came in. Um, so I remember reading the stories um, all about growing up in El Salvador in the 30s and then immigrating uh, to the US. Uh, the stories were full of hardship, overcoming hardship, um, immigrant stories that felt both familiar and unfamiliar to me. 
But I also remember thinking about how nuanced and magical they were as well. Uh, stories that reminded me of ones my parents would tell us about growing up in Korea before the war. Um, I think when we work in the creative world, so much of what we graphic designers do is make visible through translation using the tools I know how to control, which are for me for making and typography and composition systems and sequence. Um, and how books can be quite powerful when thinking about our role in witnessing, documenting and archiving. And in this way, um, it's important for us to understand the nuances of how these kinds of materials can sometimes fetishize and make other. Um, how do we act responsibly and with ethics? It's important to note that the seniors decided that all proceeds of the book will go to their choice of organization, which is St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Um, I think this is something that is talked a lot about in social work practice and um, just in social practices and something that I feel like needs more rigor in graphic design as we begin to encircle or we talk a lot about kind of social justice work and graphic design and how we collaborate in those fields. Um, so at the end of the book here, uh, Aaron writes a letter to the seniors describing the process they went through uh, with a note at the end to other social workers, urging them to consider the value of group work beyond just quantitative results. She creates a space of conversation to discuss openly about intentionality and process, implicating herself and making herself vulner vulnerable. Um, so one idea that we have started to explore in framing our ideas of the press as well as notions of care is this idea of relationality. Um, we discussed this in our last talk with the Southland Institute last year at the uh, Women's Center for Creative Work in LA. Um, and it's a concept that Erin has been writing quite a bit about um, in her practice. So Relationality, which has its roots in psychoanalysis, assumes that in any given relationship, we are making meaning together, uh, influencing each other, which sounds pretty basic and obvious. But if you think about this idea in the context of power dynamics or in the space of professional practice, it becomes much more complex. So if we think in terms of rela relationality, um, even the most professional relationships are quite porous. Uh, with our life experiences seeping in, framing how we think and act with each other. It is a really decentering concept where social workers or even a designer's role isn't necessarily to swoop in to solve problems or influence, but also not to be influenced, um, not to not be influenced either. Um, understanding care work, understanding design work, understanding our relationships with each other is so much about understanding how we influence and are influenced by each other. And it's a quite uh, vulnerable act. Um, and then so we also kind of ground the work in thinking about distribution and thinking about how distribution is also a kind of act of care. Um, and for these books and ultimately for the authors, um, visibility, the idea of visibility becomes about permanence too. So public and free spaces are really important to us. We are incredibly excited when DC Public Library carried Requerdos or when Wendy, Wendy Subway in New York City included uh, the book in their reading room at, um, at Museum of Modern Art. But what really motor mattered most to the seniors um, was the celebration that we held of this book and another memoir book that came out of the center where we invited all the seniors friends and families and DC dignitaries, including Miss Senior DC. Um, all of those people were there hearing, hearing their words. So that's the story of our first book. Um, we wanted to make more books. So even before Julie finished the design for Requerdos, we started approaching people we knew to tell them about our new press um, and to see if they might be interested in collaborating with us on a project. Um, we explained to people that we didn't want manuscripts to sift through and we often get emails sort of saying, are you interested in publishing my book? 
Um, and what we say is no, um, we want collaborations, we want ideas and relationships, we want to work together to create a highly visual book, not just to print something that already exists. Um, so in order to, to find collaborators, um, we also sent notes in the mail as a gesture that pointed to the materiality, slowness, and the personal nature of our process. And something about that in a tiny way felt kind of radical. We wanted the books to reflect our process and we wanted the different books to speak to each other. Uh, so when um, we started to think about an identity, a visual identity, as um, we really started thinking about it as a reflection of this process. So we uh, created three distinct sizes that allow for different containers of content, but also in economy as well. So the larger books that are longer in title with larger print runs, they usually, they can print offset like required as uh, printed offset. Um, and perhaps they're hard bound. We have the medium sized books that were more like paperbacks, um, perhaps produced digitally or by risograph. And then we have our smallest book that could be produced via photocopies or Rizzo at a much smaller print run. Um, so all these books share proportions and also have this like shortened page at the end to allow for process conversations to happen, uh, like in the um, pages that I showed that we showed about um, Aaron's essay in Recuerdos. Um, so this kind of structure becomes the backbone for a flexible identity. Um, similarly, we conceptualize the thick press mark as a metaphor of a thumbprint incorporating a half tone pattern to represent a printer's mark. Um, the thumbprint can move freely throughout the spine as if holding the book in different positions. Um, we are always thinking about identities. We, as in um, me as a designer and my studio mates, um, are always thinking about identities as a, a system of constants and variables constants to create recognition and familiarity, but also variables to create a framework of flexibility. So traditionally, if you look at more sort of modernist identity systems, like from you know the 60s, 70s, um, even 80s, um, and if you look at these guidelines, the rules were incredibly controlled. Um, and I'm sure if any of you have been working as designers within these spaces, there's not much freedom to play. Um, but for me, what's been really nice about working on something that is so close to me is more than feeling like I'm in control. It's really about being able to have the time to figure out the rules as we go along. Um, and there's also a point, there is a point where you need to relinquish and let others have their hands in that too. Which I think speaks to another conversation that we often have about care. How much do you hold people close? and how much do you let them go? Um, how much do you push people and offer advice? And how much do you just hold space, bear witness while people forge their own paths? So those are actually some of the questions that um, were explored in our next major book, which is called Self Carefully. Um, so one of the people who I approached was a DC-based self-care coach Gracie Obahowitz, who leads a collective of women introduced in interested in practicing self-care in service to creating a better world. Um, Gracie grounds her work both in Ayurveda, which is a sister science to yoga, and in critiques of white supremacy, the patriarchy, and consumerism. Um, I felt her take on self-care was so refreshing to read and hear, especially because self-care has become so commodified. Um, but for me, as soon as you put the idea of self-care in the context of essential workers, like social workers or healthcare workers or shift workers, it, it took on a new meaning for me, um, especially coming from a family of medical practitioners and seeing their lives every day. And in those fields that Julie's describing, um, self-care is often framed as a strategy to prevent burnout, um, but it's not approached holistically or collectively. Usually it's just about encouraging care workers to take a break, do some yoga, get a massage. Um, I knew about Gracie's work because I had taken her course, uh, Self Care 101, and I was part of the collective. And I really loved the idea of turning her teachings into a book that would be helpful uh, to other social workers and to just to care workers in general. 
So Gracie suggested that we ask her friend, Maria Habib, to design and illustrate the book. And so Gracie, Maria, and I, with Julie kind of whispering in our ears, um, embarked on this process that really mirrored Gracie's approach to self-care, which is all about taking these gentle, loving, small steps to caring for yourself. Gracie had just given birth to her first child. Uh, she didn't have the time or space to write a full length book, um, just as many overwhelmed people don't have the time or space to read a long book. So we envisioned a collection of vignettes comprising a book that could be opened at random. Kind of like picking tarot cards. Um, Gracie actually wrote most of the vignettes on her phone on the Metro. And we edited them later while the book design was in process. And that design really influenced what length we chose um, and how the editing went. And we were super flexible about deadlines. We were gentle with each other. Uh, Julie shared the medium book format with Maria, describing the size and describing the concept of the half page in the back, which would um, have some process stuff on it. Um, but otherwise she really invited Maria to have full agency over the design. So Gr Gracie, Maria and I met periodically, almost always with food, uh, first to plan our Kickstarter campaign. That was how we funded the printing. Then to talk through what mood each vignette inspired, which would help Maria with the illustration. And then we laid out, we met and we laid out all the um, vignettes on the floor in order to come up with an order. And that was like a really sort of intuitive, fun process for us. Um, we worked with, well, you can talk about the Rizzo, Julie. So we also work closely with um, a, a Rizzo graph printer, Erica Federin um, in DC. And I don't know if you guys have access to a Rizzo graph, but um, for those of you who don't know, there are really these amazing printing machines as, um, uh, that can print really bright colors, fluorescent colors, if you have it. Um, it operates uh, uh, with multiple drums holding one layer of color. Um, so issues of registration can be tricky. Um, and the process is extremely hands-on and can be quite finicky. So the, this book was especially challenging. It had four different colors, shorn pages at the end. Um, we felt really terrible for our amazing Erica, um, but understood the process. So we, you know, again, it's like sort of that gentle, that gentle collaboration. Um, and uh, she worked really hard to deliver the books to us, especially as an individual printer. She, she works solo in her studio. Um, so for the second edition, we decided with Erica's blessing to collaborate with a larger Rizzo printer called Resolve, who could take on sort of the, the scope of work. Um, and that second printing was 500. Uh, so, and we still consider Erica an integral part of the second printing because she was so involved in establishing the methodology with Maria. Um, and she's also been printing our new series, which we'll talk about later. Um, but I think it speaks to how important the relationships are to us and also to the relationality, uh, the way you can sort of, you can sort of find traces of the relationships in, in each book object. Um, in every future project, just as um, almost everybody still remembers their elementary school teachers. So beyond process, we also learned a lot about care from self care Felice content. Um, the book breaks down just incredibly simply the idea that because of so many aspects of our culture, um, because of consumerism, because of white supremacy, because of misogyny, um, because of all those and other oppressive social structures, uh, authentic self-care and really just care in general um, is countercultural. It requires us to swim against the current and that requires us to join in with others who are committed to a similar path. Um, so that's why for the half pages, um, we presented quotations from three people in Gracie's circle who draw, draw on uh, authentic self-care concepts 
as they perform the work of organizing, advocacy, counseling, and teaching. And that very first conversation that Gracie recorded with one of those people, a minister and community organizer named Louise Green, was so interesting that we wanted to capture it in its entirety and we wanted to capture its influence on the whole project. So we had the opportunity to do that um, when the two of us came up with the idea of a new series, or I guess our first series, called Book Emerging. And that really came out of conversations about materiality, about how important it is to give physical form to emerging work. And I've sort of learned from Julie that design has this long tradition of collaboration and iteration, um, multiple, working with others on multiple versions, but writers tend to work alone, um, presenting their editors with a relatively polished draft of their work. So we liked the idea of turning various aspects of our process into a book that we could distribute at book fairs from our website in very small numbers. So the pressure was off and we wanted these books to be authorless, to also take the pressure of authoring off and to focus on the collaborative multi-voice nature of what we're trying to do in general. So the book emerging concept plays with the idea of intertextuality, uh, allowing for books to be shuffled and reshuffled in different ways. You can see sort of um, three distinct sections with three distinct sizes. Um, um, it's bound kind of loosely, um, let me see if I can play this, yeah, uh, by a rubber band with the hope of creating surprising juxtapositions in both content and form. And this is, um, this is a video that is playing uh, from uh, the Independent Art Book Fair in Brooklyn. And we're sort of performing the book being um, sort of put together in these interesting or maybe just um, different ways. Um, uh, so here, the same book emerging booklet can, can sort of be shown in different ways, um, which allows for the content and the form to intermingle and to think about how the text might be able to create new connections by these juxtapositions. Over the next two years, um, we produced four more books emerging, two of which were associated with major titles and two of which for now at least stand as um, serve as standalone projects. Uh, so these books were able to help serve in form as a place to start for our collaborator, collaborators and for the editorial structure. Um, if we could think about the books as intertextual or kind of pastiche, could that help enable a process of discovery? This idea of thinking through a process that creates more of a flexible space between writing, design, and editing is something we are really interested in. And it turns out it's also been speaking to our growing understanding um, of care. I think I tend to confuse careful, painstaking actions with good care. Um, in my remote work with senior citizens, I. I just feel bad sometimes if I don't call somebody back immediately or if I'm having an off day and I'm counseling somebody. Um, but I think perfectionism can be super dangerous uh, in creative work. It can lead to blockages. And I think it can also lead to blockages when it comes to the act of offering care, both to your loved ones and to strangers. Um, I years ago read about a study about why tech giants don't give away more money, why they aren't bigger philanthropists. And the conclusion was that they can't figure out the perfect place to give, so they give nowhere. Um, and I think that dynamic kind of explains why people don't get more involved in civic causes. And I know it's probably pretty specific to our experience, but I feel like it's worth mentioning as we explore what we're learning about care. I also think um, book emerging really helped us move out of the stream of commerce or really more accurately out of this fantasy that we were going to make profit from independently selling our books from our website. Um, and then we've sort of moved into a non-commercial stream of book distribution. Um, so we thought if we just sold them all ourselves, we could sustain the, pre the press through book sales because there would be no middleman. 
Um, but we found out it's really hard to sell books, um, especially if you're not really into social media or and if you're sort of like anti-capitalist, it doesn't go so well. Um, and book emerging really showed us what zine makers and DIY folks have known all along, which is that we could photocopy and bind books ourselves for very little money. We could find great meaning in the act and we could feel proud of the finished product and it didn't matter, you know, we sold them for printing costs and the whole thing was, was great. Um, but we still wanted to make books that got distributed widely. And I think it was really letting go of the idea that we would need to make profit from the books themselves that inspired us to seek fiscal sponsorship. Um, and that made us able to apply for grants for our work. And it allowed us to start distributing our books with the nonprofit distributor, small press distribution. We hadn't been willing to do this before um, because instead of getting $20 for a book that's sold, we take in more like $5. Um, what does all that have to do with care? Um, still not sure, but um, I'm definitely struck by the parallels between our experience with books and my growing realization that in my vengeance, um, just knowing how ridiculous it, is, it, ridiculous it is to apply a market-based consumer-oriented model to social and medical services. Yeah. Um, so this book emerging, A Knock on the Door, is connected to our third and most recent major title um, called Stages on Dying, Working and Feeling by Rachel Cowder Nailbuff which came out in June. Um, I got to know Rachel several years ago when my studio uh, did the design work for Three Hole Press, which is Ra uh, which Rachel founded um, in an effort to give book form to performance scripts. Uh, we turned to Rachel for advice about fundraising and other small press concerns. Um, and we discovered a shared interest in care work. At that time, Rachel had, she was wrapping up a project with nursing home staff and she'd interviewed 19 staff members, not just nutritionists, uh, nurses and others who we associate with nursing home care work, but also a cashier clerk, a housekeeper, the CEO of the nursing home and more. And she pulled together the words from those interviews and she created a script. She then directed 10 of the staff members in a performance that was part of the Reimagine End of Life Festival in New York in November of 2018. So our book Emerging, uh, which contained the script and the full interviews served as the program for that performance, which Erin attended. Um, so throughout the process of collecting the interviews and writing and directing the performance, Rachel, who was in her 20s, was going through a breakup and the loss of her grandfather. She was also awakening to what it means to live an emotionally, politically engaged life. Um, and she wanted to write about her experiences. Um, and she also wanted to share the experiences of the nursing home workers so she created a kind of braided narrative that contains vignettes about her life and work, snapshots from that time period and carefully edited interviews with the staff members. Erin. We had hoped to disseminate stages in the same way we disseminated self carefully, uh, where we sent out emails to the media, which off rarely <laughs> results in press. Um, also podcasters, which a little more successful, arranging for readings at bookstores. Uh, we did manage to do one in-person pre-release reading in February at Wendy's Subway in Brooklyn. Uh, Julie. So then COVID hit, our kids' schools closed, uh, the killing of George Floyd deepened racial reckoning, um, and that pl plan no longer made sense. Uh, we held off on bookstore events we felt that over the summer, everybody was just too overloaded by Zoom things. Um, we did stick with our original plan to do a launch event as part of the Reimagine End of Life Festival and decided that as part of the Zoom event, um, we would offer folks the chance to take a walk 
um, listen to a higher quality reading than is possible on Zoom, and then guide people in either thinking or journaling about some questions which are um, listed here that uh, um, uh, Rachel wrote. Um, I can say, what is one thing that is ending in your life growing up? How was grief made visible or public around you? What is the role of grief in public around you now? What would you like it to be? What is an act of care in your daily life that you are grateful for right now? So these were some of the questions that she asked um, to the participants. Um, and then these were some of the um, impressions that were shared on the chat. Um, and uh, we won't read all of them, but I can read some. So uh, my girlfriend made me breakfast to be surrounded by his family when he died, roommates washing dishes for each other. Uh, Susie put a bandaid on the back of my arm where I can't reach. Um, and when we were um, promoting that event, Julie created some short videos, which we posted on Instagram. And we're gonna share those videos with you just to give you a sense first of Rachel's work um, and also of the carefully conceived way that we decided to share it during a time when like now, um, live readings just weren't happening. And this kind of shows how we try to think of not only our books, but also our events and even our infrequent social media posts as gifts to the people who behold them. So the first video are, you know, is, um, I remember how we said there's, it's a braided narrative. There's interviews with the nursing home staff and then there's Rachel's sort of own vignettes and then there's also images. So you'll get to hear first an interview with Rosa and then second one of the, uh, a really great um, vignette by Rachel. And she is also, she's the one reading the, the recording. So uh, let us know if you don't hear the audio. We tested it and I think, I think it's good, but um, just let us know if you don't hear it. A Conversation with Rosa, Housekeeper, 12 Years. You've been thinking about the internet and- How did you become comfortable with death? Morning. If you don't accomplish anything in life, you accomplish death. I've always wondered what life is like after death. I've seen a lot of dead people, people who get shot. How does it feel? Where do people go? I'm curious. I've always been curious about how you take care of a wound, how you take a heart out. I watched a lot of medical TV. I wanted to be a mortician, but I couldn't work while being in school. Beyond your official position, what do you do here? I'm a housekeeper, but I notice what people need. I take people's shoes off. I turn the temperature up. There's this woman who lives here who doesn't get a lot of visitors, so I brought her a plant, this purple plant. Now she calls it her baby. People ask me for favors. Will you go buy donuts? Then I'll do it. One woman gave me a shopping list for Walmart and I did it. Sometimes because I feel bad, sometimes because they're like family. With your own money? On your own time? Yes, on my own time. The other day I had to do something with my daughter, but I told her we had to stop at the dollar store because a resident wanted a hair scarf. My daughter's used to it. It's a part of her life. I've bought residents wigs, potato chips, cheese puffs. A lot of people lose socks in the laundry. What is your advice about dying? The shoulda, woulda, couldas. Don't let someone pass away with any of those. Tomorrow isn't promised to anyone, so take care of those. Reconcile with family. How do you imagine death? Hmm. I imagine it just as being free. Coleman called me late at night to talk through music for the show. He had been thinking about the internet and the absence of ceremony around death. We mourned Anthony Bourdain, but like for two days, all on our phones. A police or school shooting might not even get that much. A week later, it feels like it never happened. As Coleman kept talking, I started looking out the window. 
I started thinking about how I've separated the politics of the nursing home from my own life. After interviews, I always want to shake someone and say, how can you put people through the abysses of grief without providing emotional resources? We're not just talking about physical exploitation. We're talking about the exploitation of people's souls. But the nursing home is just a microcosm of my world. How is grief valued in my life? Is it? Growing up, my family talked about grief in terms of how quickly you could get back to work. In the academic part of the city where we lived, there were no vigils. I never saw candles on the street. Now, I take in my friends' sorrows alongside the tragedies of the world every day. In spare moments on the subway, on the toilet, in bed. But I rarely remember what I read. Information, it seems, is not a substitute for grief. Of course. Of course. I think I need someone, someone in my life, someone in my real life, someone with power in my life to say, please take a minute. Or I need some kind of value system, some kind of culture, some kind of circle, some kind of march, some kind of protest, some kind of hand on my shoulder in my real life to say, take some time. Please take time. Take time with others. This is as important as drinking water. This is important to ignore this kills some essential part of you. When the people I interview are forced to rush through relentless loss, they become numb, unable to care for the next resident. I have passed by so many griefs. I am afraid. I am afraid for myself. And I am afraid of not caring because I do care. I care so much about the world. I, I think I do. No, I do. I really do care. Or I want to actually care. And I am really afraid for the world if there are others like me, too. I think that passage um, really speaks to the importance of feeling our feelings, particularly around grief. Um, as a social worker, I know this, of course I know this, um, but somehow first self-carefully and then stages really hit home the idea that um, in order to sustain care of ourselves, of others, of the planet, um, we need to, as we say in my field, sit with the feelings before we jump to critique, before we jump to action. And not just because it'll make us better at caring, um, not just because tamping down our feelings always comes back to bite us, but also because tears and laughter are precious in their own right. Um, that's at least how Julie and I feel, even though we realize that that could be critiqued as sentimental. I love the idea of sitting with feelings and that perhaps part of my job is to develop that feeling state and do under and uh, to understand where the boundaries of that feeling state lies and form and sequence as well. Um, so in this book, there was an idea of pacing that was really important to how the book was read. Rachel's writing uh, works as vignettes um, and she was so precise with regard to how she chose her words and where the spaces and pauses might be. Um, and I think that's what we're sort of talking about when we explain that we're interested in the poetics of care. Um, and that was what poetic was what we were committed to as we worked really closely and carefully with Rachel to get every word right. Um, so what does this book mean to us in terms of how we are framing care? Uh, we circle words like rigor and craft as a kind of care. Uh, Rachel took the bus down to DC and stayed at Aaron's house for a session of really intense editing. Um, and sometimes it feels a bit navel gazing to equate the exacting care, we like the word rigor, that all three of us took with word choice, with where to place images and so on. Um, and to equate that with the kind of care that the nursing home took with dying residents. 
um, that idea of like, we're not, we're not doing brain surgery really nags um, at my brain, but we like to think in terms of microcosms and we find ourselves very attracted by the idea that if we slow down, if we do things well in small areas, then our culture, our, our culture will shift in bigger ways um, and that we care can be small, caring can be small. And at the very least, um, the work of making a small run book, just like the work of, of caring for people is low impact work when it comes to harming people and the planet. Um, in our collaboration with Rachel, there's always a lot of back and forth about which books to read. And that led us to read A Planet to Win. And we all got excited by the idea that both care work and art making fit into imaginaries of a greener world. Um, so Aaron and Rachel discussed this idea in an interview that we first posted on Medium. We love using Medium as a space also to sort of publish um, texts. Um, and then as part of another new series that was already in the works, uh, we created a pamphlet of the interview Rizzo printed by Erica, who was the first one who, uh, who did the first self-care affiliate. Um, we either give away the pamphlets or we sell them for a dollar from our website or at book fairs. Um, so the series is called Printout and it's about giving physical form to digital content. We're interested in the idea of a, of a post-digital world where switching back and forth between digital content and books happens seamlessly um, because digital is no longer really a thing um, and print is very enduring, it's permanent. And then um, after COVID hit, we did another conversation with Rachel where we explored the idea that we discussed earlier, which is the importance of feeling our feelings and how important that is in this particular historical moment. Um, we were all ready to publish this conversation on Medium. And then we saw that the DC area based arts platform, DIRT was looking for writing. So we submitted it to them. Um, and, and Erica made a printout of it. Um, our newest medium piece, which won't make it into a printout because it contains so many internet li links, is a list of electronic resources related to healing justice, which is a strategy that was born in the South among community organizers leading movements for Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and LGBTQI liberation um, against the industrial prison industrial complex and other oppressive institutions. Healing justice tends to the trauma um, experienced by community members. And it's really a strategy, not, um, not an end in and of itself. Although in this conversation tonight, we've talked a lot about books for book's sake and care for care's sake and feelings for feeling's sake. So we're really looking forward to talking with those collab, to dialogue with um, our collaborators on the Healing Justice Project about all that. So um, there's so much more we could talk about with respect to liberation and care and these little utopian interactions that we're trying to create in the midst of everything that's happening around all of us, but we're running out of time. <laughs> um, which is another theme that comes up a lot. Portion <laughs> of care. How do we deal with the boundlessness of others' needs and our own need for boundaries? Um, yeah, so... Um, we really want to understand what care means to you guys. So uh, we wanted to take a moment in the chat, if it's possible, um, kind of to let us know um, what does care mean to you? Um, so we're gonna wrap up after this and we wanna hear your questions, but if you could just type away right now, we would be really grateful. Um, if you don't mind, we might even use your responses in future work because that's how we work. Um, everything is process. Everything, I mean, everything is fodder for our work. Julie, do you want to read what people are writing for the recording? Sure, sure, sure. Um, care means listening, 
noticing the details in everyday life, surroundings, consideration, care means respecting boundaries, listening, reflection, empathy, stepping outside of yourself. Care means giving myself and the around um, and around me time and space to process feelings. Um, care is the feeling of connection. Um, it is to kick and scream. It is to feel. Being considered as a unique person as opposed to a member of a group. Uh, disconnecting from the internet. Slowing down, holding space. Care is making time for those who matter the most to you. This is so great, thank you. Cooking for others. So keep on, keep on going if you can. Um, and so we just, this is sort of the end of our, of our talk. We want to thank you so much for all the responses and thank you for listening to us, to us tell our stories and work through what we are learning about care from our books. Um, you can kind of keep abreast of what we're doing through our Instagram, which is below at Thick Press. Um, and, or you can sign up for our newsletter, very infrequent. We don't really like clog people's um, uh, mailbox, but you can sign up on our website, uh, thickpress.com. And then we also recommend, um, if you're interested in learning more about small presses and artist publishing, um, you can check out Printed Matters Art Book Fair, which is usually in New York, but this year it'll be online from February 25th to February 28th. So no matter where you are, you can enjoy content from us and from other small presses from all over.